These are cool. Just like lunch after lunch. no audio but look at this that's beautiful all of them are beautiful in their own way yeah <clears throat> look at that going to above the cloud that's pretty cool yeah the fuel dumps that iridescence they cause must just be spectacular to see yeah i've seen a couple the first one i saw we were at We were in the desert, and uh, I had my 13-inch telescope, and and I was able to um, I was able to watch it, you know, just by holding my Dobsonian telescope and just kind of manually tracking it and stuff. It was so cool to watch the stage separation and all of that stuff. So it was very interesting. Uh, the only real launch I ever saw ever, um, you know, from the ground up was uh, the last space shuttle launch. And uh, so um, uh, uh, Mike Reynolds, Dr. Mike Reynolds, who has since uh, passed on, uh, took me um, and uh, with him, uh, I had a press pass from Astronomy Magazine, and we both went to uh, cover... Um, uh, this last space shuttle launch with uh, astronomy, and so I was I went there as a kind of technical backup, you know, because Mike did the photography and he wrote, um, you know, the story and everything. So that was just so awesome. Uh, but uh, you know, the 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 thrust and the pounding of the of the concussion on your chest and everything was just incredible. And we were at the same distance that they let all the other press at so we were just a, as close as I guess they let anybody and we were just miles away you know they say if you get too close the sound will kill you the sound pressure is so oh, much it'll imagine. kill you the sound will kill you I can imagine I can yeah. imagine yeah yeah 
That's crazy. Uh, <clears throat> so today we have, uh, uh, sadly, we learned that um, Michael Collins of, um, uh, passed on today. He was 90 years old, uh, apparently battling cancer for a while. And um, so that was, uh, that was uh, sad. He was there with, uh, of course, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong. And um, he's the guy... He's the guy that uh, fulfilled John F. Kennedy's promise of getting men to the moon and get him safely back to Earth, you know. And so, um, but uh, what's interesting, there's so many stories that revolve around uh, uh, this Apollo mission, but uh, one of them was, is of course, when they went to go land the lunar lander, uh, you know, of course, they're running out of fuel and everything, and they didn't want to land on boulders. So when they actually did find a place to land and sat down, they could not tell NASA exactly where they were on the moon. Not exactly. They were off a few miles, okay? And they asked uh, Michael Collins to use a telescope to actually see if he could recover them telescopically from orbit, and he was unable to. So, um, so it was... Uh, you know, they knew where they were going, but they didn't know where they were. So, <laughs> and there's a there's a David Byrne song. Uh, it might be uh, from Talking Heads, uh, but uh, you know, we're on the road to nowhere. And I started. I I just learned that they did not know. Uh, in fact, it's just days ago, and I was listening to the song. And I was going, "Wow, this song must have been written about this experience." You know. <clears throat> if you listen to the lyrics, uh, you're on the road to nowhere. From so they didn't know exactly where they landed until no. they got back and looked at the film no. and was able to go, okay, that's where they it were. It wasn't until a lot longer, you know, uh, that they were able to pinpoint it. And, uh, of wow. course, uh, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiters photographed it. And right. So we know exactly where it is now. But at the time, no, we didn't know. So. Yeah, because the moon is still a big place. Right. I mean, it's not like, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, right. You know, like and, an I, and I, was, I always felt bad for the <clears throat> mission commanders because they're what, 60 miles from the moon, but yet yeah. they don't get to be on the moon. You know, I mean, just, it's like, it's like well, you're, you're so close, but you're in not the there. Case of Michael Collins, he was. <laughs> the only human, you know, as far away from Earth as anyone, you know, mm -hmm. at, as he's going around the so-called uh, unlit side, the dark side, or the far side of the moon, you know. He was and, farther uh, away than anybody else yeah, by yeah. himself. And I had heard that that had kind of a psychological effect on him at the time, so. Well, that, that is an overwhelming sort of concept when you think about it. Yeah, you're all alone. You're 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 you. You don't have radio contact. Nothing. You're, you're completely and utterly isolated for radio blackout. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and you and and when you look down at the Earth, everything that has ever existed in human history is visible to you. Right. On that little pale blue dot. On that pale you know? blue dot. That's right. No, that's... pale blue ball at that distance. But that's just yeah. crazy to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, last night on the Global Star Party, uh, had a, just a terrific lineup. Uh, uh, for those of you that watched it, I hope that you really enjoyed it. I know that uh, the people presenting had a great time. Um, I think that they felt, uh, the presenters felt like it was the, one of the best uh, events that they had attended. Um, uh, John Briggs' uh, account of uh, wintering over at... Uh, a Munson Scott uh, South Pole Station in Antarctica, you know, led, it, it, as we were preparing that uh, presentation stuff, he and I had a long conversation about what it's going to be like for colonists on the moon and Mars, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, John Briggs thinks that uh, for people that will, especially on Mars, the one thing that will be on their mind the entire time is they can't wait to get back to Earth, you know. Because it's an oasis here, it's beautiful, you know, and uh, I think that's, I think that is something, I mean, there are astronauts that feel like, you know, that they belong in space, and, and I was, I was watching a documentary about the International Space Station, and um, one of the astronauts was saying that, that, uh, that she felt 
that she was born to be in space and the only time she ever felt home ever was actually on the International Space Station, which she stayed on, I think, for six months. Um, but, uh, you know, I think a lot of people, the colonists uh, especially, you know, they'll be really looking forward to getting back to Earth, you know. And maybe, maybe that's an experience that all of us should have because, you know, we, we take the Earth for granted. We wake up, we do our thing every day. People will ask you, are you having a good day? Are you having a bad day? What, you know, every day on Earth should be like this amazing day. You're alive, right? There's water. Yeah. There's air to breathe. Uh, well, you know. and he talked about the isolation. And, you know, yeah, and just the don't sheer... have to go very far to see others of us. You know, right. maybe you're not close friends with them or anything, and and maybe you feel lonely about that. But you know what? You're here with billions of other people on this planet. So, but when you're on the moon base and it's you and 22 other people, or whatever the number is, and at least you can get back to Earth in, a, in four or five days. Once you get on Mars, there's no return for, what, 18 months? You're there. There's no coming back. Yeah. And, and it's survival. You have to survive. You know, yeah, so, it's, there's I mean, no, no options. You have to, you have to do it. And, and if you turn out to be psychologically unfit for it, the options are not very many for what everybody else is going to have to do to oh my God. deal yeah. with that situation. Right. You know, uh, it's just, just mind boggling to think Maybe about. There's those like things. a timeout place they can put them or something. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Go, go over that big red rock and hold your breath for, for 30 seconds and then come <laughs> back inside. If you feel better, then you don't have to go back out. That's right. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, it's just crazy to think about what that, that really entails. Because, right. you know, that, that isolation that he talked about, you know, total darkness for roughly six months, you know, and then the sunrise took, what, a couple of weeks, you know, for it to finally get above the horizon and become day again. And he talked about the joy of the sound of the airplane and then smelling the exhaust. The exhaust, yeah. The exhaust. Is that going home or something. That, yeah, that meant fresh, you know. And, and, you know, they do get fresh shipments. They drop in stuff by parachute, but then they have to go out and minus whatever to go. Minus find 106. The, yeah. And, you know, bundle up to find the stuff. But he said he, the one thing here he talked about that struck me was the smell of the exhaust of the C-130. Yeah, me too. You know? and, yeah. and then when the when the station director gave him the, your park, turn off your engines, it's yeah. over. That marked it, the it, end of. Uh... It was a ceremonial end of their, of their stay, and they were just so excited to hug kiss and get on that airplane and leave. Right. Know? So, yeah. But also, you know, they love the fact that they were there too, you know, and that adventure and all the rest of it. So, um, you know, definitely a, a, a bucket list thing to, to do. Um, but, um, and then, uh, you know, uh, uh, I was surprised at the end, I, I didn't expect it, but Deep, Deep T. Gautam came on, you know, she's from Nepal, and uh, she, uh, she showed her first ever moon photograph, um, uh, which was really cool, and uh, she, uh, so she used her, you know, she used her cell phone and stuff, and, and, and it wasn't very sharp or anything, but you could see detail, you know, and she was proud enough to show it uh, to the whole world, and, and she knows the kind of people that are on our show. So um, I thought that that was that was sweet for her to take that opportunity to do that. And um, she um, she then had uh, drafted a poem that she read, and it was the first poem that she had done in English. And uh, it's it's sort of romantic, but it's about a star, you know. And she had written it for a friend. And so that was really cool. That was really cool. Um, earlier today, um, I connected with uh, um, uh, Diana uh, Herber, I believe is how, how we pronounce her name. Yeah, Herber. And she is, uh, uh, she will be coming on to some of our shows and the Global Star Party and um, uh, eventually... Uh, we have plans for her to be a special guest host of Global Star Party. But she has formed 
a all women uh, astrophotography group that has members from all over the world. And so we were talking about that this afternoon uh, during during my lunch. And um, uh, so I'm really excited to um, to have her come on. Uh, I won't tell you too much more about it. If you're if you know about Diana, you already know what I'm talking about. But but uh, I think it'll be very cool to uh, have all these members on from around the world. And when I say around the world, I mean from almost every country. They're, they have something like 60 members or something like that. And uh, they're growing, you know, because, um, you know, they're a great support group for each other. We did touch on the fact that um, often uh, women and girls get sidelined in, uh, in our hobby. You know, there's more... In fact, one of the things I learned from being with the uh, uh, one of the advisors on the with the uh, American Astronomical Society is that professional the professional world of astronomy and science is is more inclusive now. I mean, it didn't used to be, but more inclusive now than it, than amateur astronomy is, um, and that that uh, kind of shocked me. But uh, we have done some. Um, uh, the group has now done some studies, and there's uh, there's a lot of room for us to grow uh, because uh, female astronomers are some of the best astronomers in the world. Uh, you're going to definitely want them in your group, and you're going to want to be learning from them, you know. Um, but for a lot of them, it's a big struggle to even learn some of the basics of astrophotography and stuff, um, you know. So it's... Um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy. Let me just put it that way. And uh, that's the reason why this group was formed, so, uh, which I think is wonderful. Um, so, um, you know, if you know of, uh, of a young lady or girl or, you know, uh, older women even uh, that are getting into the hobby uh, of astrophotography for the first time, uh, they're going to want to connect with this group for sure, and uh, and certainly join our group, the Explorer Alliance. You know, we're we're very uh, we embrace um, all of that, and uh, you know, we 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 would love to see uh, as many women and female astronomers involved as possible. So, and membership can be free, right? By the way, so yeah, the price is right. Yeah, so we're going to, um, <laughs> the price is right, um, uh, we're going to turn back to uh, the universe sampler. Kent, you're getting down, you're going to go to, I guess, the, the final part of this, which you're calling chapter 13, but we've been doing this now for weeks, and um, uh, how would you summarize the universe sampler? What, what, what are you left with there? I, I'm left with, you know... I, it is a good way for me to um, remind myself of how I need to talk in more simple terms to people sometimes, uh, that it's easy to start talking in, in lingo and jargon and um, overwhelm people with... Yep. Uh, things like you start talking about right ascension and declination and, and precession and yeah, you're rattling distance. off all the and, and, uh, and they just go uh, I don't right. know what he's talking about yeah. right. and it's, it has just become a, a good <clears throat> reminder that frankly I'm going to try and read a couple of times a year just to sort of ground myself in very simple terminology um, and remember when you're talking to people it's a really simple is 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 by far the best way to explain complicated terms, plain English, if you can. Um, I, you know, it's hard to explain plain English in, in, in simple terms because, you know, right essential the declination, well, you know, out, you know, same as longitude and latitude, but if the people don't understand longitude and latitude, then where do you start? Uh, so there's, it's just a reminder, simple things and going through what were chapter 13? There is no chapter 13 in the universe sampler. It's really what you have to do to earn the observing club uh, award. Um, it, so I just called it chapter 13. And it's just a good foundational way to start learning the sky. That's what this is about. It's the entry point 
into learning the sky. And that's where we go. So off we go. I'm sharing my screen. Uh, what to do to earn your certificate. Um, hello, come on computer. There we go. Okay, you've all seen this before, unless you're new, and then you haven't seen this before. Universe Sampler, uh, get the book for $13. It's a worthy investment. Um, it's great to use, you know, to guide yourself through. Uh, Scott's going to share that link so everybody can have it. And uh, details on the Observing Club are at that second link. Tell me when to go, Scott. Hold on, let me get the last one here. So okay. uh, Her Her Harold, Harold Locke asked a question while, while we're, we're waiting. You just got to bubble that answer. He asked, was uh, Elon Musk's comments about, you know, Mars astronaut survivability truthful? Uh, absolutely. Uh, the, the Russians have proven and the United States and other agencies have proven landing on Mars is not easy. Uh, the Russians, I don't think, have ever made it successfully to Mars other than some very short duration, like 100 seconds before it fizzled out. Um, you know, it's not an easy place to get to. Uh, the atmosphere is 1% of Earth. So if you step outside, not in a spacesuit, uh, you will basically freeze dry. You'll boil yourself and freeze dry. Um, it's totally inhospitable. Uh, there's a massive amount of solar radiation. Um, it's going to be a tough thing. And if you, if you think about it, you know, when, uh, um, you know, Captain Cook and his crew sailed off westward, uh, they, most of them died and did not make the circumnavigation back home. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it was when you sailed off in a boat in whenever. Oh, my God. Yeah. It There's was, no GPS, no radio. You're no, not, you, you might no as well play on signal, the, nothing. <laughs> you, you're, you're not coming back until you come back. And you, your family had to accept the fact that you're gone and you may yeah. never turn up again. Did you sink? Did you get, you know, killed by natives? Did you get sick? Uh, did you fall off the edge of the earth for the flat earthers? Yeah, did you um, get hurt? Yeah. Yeah, just, what happened? Did getting you, hurt on, on deck, you know. There's... Yeah, yeah, it's a dang, the ship deck and wooden sailing ship was dangerous. Did you get a rope rack around your leg and get right. yanked off? Did you do something stupid that make you walk the plank? I mean, you know, what happens? And so it's the same with, 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 so with exploration of space. There's no guarantee. And people get comfortable with the idea that, like the space shuttle, the space shuttle, they're like, oh, it's very safe. It's not going to be a problem. And then, you know, we had two failures in, in roughly 100 launches, which turns out is exactly what the GSA predicted in their studies, that there would be an average of two catastrophic losses per every 100 launches, which is effectively what we had. So they hit the nail on the head. When you climb aboard a rocket, you're acknowledging the fact that you're accepting the risk of, of getting blown to smithereens. Long story short. And when you go to Mars, you're going to accept the fact that you're going to die on Mars and pretty well guaranteed. If you survive, then glory be hallelujah. You're going to get some recognition, you know, but it's, it's tough. So, but yes, Harold, it was true. All right, the warning, don't look at the sun ever, never, 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 ever. Inspect your solar film. We've been over this a couple of times. Um, lots of things to see. Uh, do not forget to cover your finder scope because somebody can burn themselves or boil an eyeball and make sure your filter to the telescope is on so it cannot come off. All right, uh, these are the object lists that you have to observe. I'm getting ready to sneeze, excuse me. Allergies. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, my, right. my black truck out there is golden, with covered in pollen. We need know? to we need to go collect some of that pollen and see if we can see what it looks like under microscopes for the Friday show. Yeah. We'll okay. Do that. So these are telescope users and naked eye observers. A list of uh, bright stars you have to see. 
and you learn the proper name of 15 of them that can be seen from your latitude and the constellation in which they're found. Sketch the scars that make up the constellation boundary and label the bright stars. No need colors seen. Pretty straightforward. All of these observing clubs have one common thing, one thing in common. Document, document, document. Yeah. If you don't document, you don't get in the observing award, okay? Right, it's um, observation. So. Because uh, uh, Jamie, was it Jamie Heineman or Adam Savage? I think it was Adam Savage, one of them on Mythbusters. Yeah. Says, says that the difference between play and science is that when you're doing science, you write it down. Yeah. You know, because otherwise you're just playing. But if you write it down, you're doing science. So you might as well do some science. Okay. And you got to do some other stuff. Uh, estimate. Estimate the angular distance between various stars, and it even tells you which lesson to go to in the book. And to recall, it's it uses your fist, your finger, three fingers, walking across the sky. Uh, estimate the azimuth and altitude of Altair. You can do the same thing, and you need to write down the time when you do it because obviously the altitude of Capella and Altair change over the course of the night, so there needs to be some time uh, notation and date. Uh, make brightness estimates of, of uh, variable stars. Uh, meteors. Plot the path of two meteors on a star chart. Whoops. My mouse took off. Okay, you got to, as I said, uh, advanced preparation is required because you just can't go out on any night and um, see meteors. Um, you can, especially in summer on any given night, but light pollution has really cut down most people's ability to see those just random uh, meteors that are coming every which direction. So it's best to plan for a, a, at least a meteor shower and uh, go observe some meteors. Uh, observe the sun through a pinhole camera. Um, you know, you can do it with a, a telescope equipped with filters if you want to, but I think there's a certain feeling of accomplishment to take a shoe box or a, a, a cardboard box of some me measure, a big one, cut a hole in it so you can see inside of it, put a piece of white paper in one end, piece of aluminum foil on the other, and poke a hole in it so the light shines through and you can see an image of the sun projected uh, onto a sheet of paper. That, so it's a, it's a pinhole camera that you made. Um, now we get into telescope users. Uh, planets in a comet. Once again, it's pretty easy to view planets at any given time, but the problem is comets, you know, one comet of your choice, uh, any comet, well, you know, comets have been, while they, they're regular visitors, you know, there so, they're, have not been big, bright comets, you know, other than uh, Neowise last year. And, you know, it wasn't a, a it wasn't a, a, a massively, seen everyone notices it sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but Neil Wise was a good comet mm -hmm. that sparked a lot of interest as well. Oh, yeah. But you have to, you know, pay attention and go, oh, there's a comet and then go find it. Um, observe the moon, moon features. Um, you know, uh, a lot of this involves sketching. Uh, deep sky objects you got to look at. And here's the deep sky objects list. Um, and here are the simple sketches that uh uh, Amelia Goldberg, who wrote the uh, Universe Sampler, uh, did, and some notes she took about each one. Um, I mean, not the list, but these are deep sky objects that she looked at. And then the spring group, the summer group, and the uh, fall group as well. Uh, a lot of NGC stuff, uh, you know, uh, involved in this. Um, my computer's growing a mind of its own. And uh, last but not least, we get to the end of the book, and here is a uh, updated list of the Astronomical League programs as as of this printing of this version of the book I've, of the of the one I've got. Um, you know, I, I think that looking through this, you know, there are some the asterisms would be a really good one to start. That would be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Doing the asterisms and it's a list of asterisms you gotta have to find. I haven't looked at it, but things like the coat hanger and the 37, you know, star cluster and things like that. 
Um, seven you know, sisters, I guess. So yeah, be... the seven sisters are probably on there. Uh, but the th small constellations like Delphinius are not really? an asterism; they're a constellation. Right, but it's it, a little tiny thing. You know? Yeah, it's you know, you know, it's, it's a dolphin. Eculus. Know? Eculus is a very small one. Yeah. But, you know, so, so I wonder what the difference between that being a constellation and the plane it, it was, being this this asterism, you know, the uh, seven sisters or the coat hanger being, you know, why isn't it a constellation? Yeah, so. I don't know. It's crazy. You know, you, there's all sorts cut. of questions. It great. It, I think probably because there was other stuff around it and where, where Delphinius is, there's not much. They said, okay, that's got to be a constellation because there's nothing else. Maybe, maybe Delphinius it. clears its orbit or something. Or... It could be. It made it, made it a planet as a planet. <laughs> So if we use the uh, the definition of a planet for yeah, at least use those they, definitions. <laughs> they cleared they cleared the or orbit. Uh, let's see. So might as well. Uh, Lunar Observing Club. Um, you get down here to the bottom, and the Outreach Award. Um, I have. I need to go back and just document what I've because I've re reached all levels of the of the Outreach Award over the years, but I haven't really documented it. So it's a matter of documentation. And you just document it and turn it in because, you know, every star party you go to counts for hours. Sure. Um, you give a speech at a Rotary Club, that counts. Right. You know, so there's all sorts of uh, ways to do it. Um, and then I get down here to the bottom, the Sunspotters Club. Now that we're thankfully coming out of Solar Minimum, I think would be a fun one to work on. Sure. Um, and uh, obviously the Universe Sampler. But then the Urban Observing Award. I think the Urban Observing Award is because most people who are members of the Astronomical League live in urban areas. That's where the populations are. I think it makes sense that the Urban Observing Club would be a, a very early uh, observing club for somebody who wants to start as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it can get pretty, you know, mundane. The Herschel 400 and the Herschel 2 Club and the Herschel Society, you know, those are ones for for much more um, robust, experienced observers. Yeah. So anyway, yep. that's that. Wow. I feel like we've done this whole uh, program right now, but now we got to actually go out and do it, right? So. And I'm going to commit to going out and doing it. I've, you know, I, I do have my Messier binocular, uh, binocular Messier, uh, award. Um, I've done the Messiers multiple times, mm -hmm. just haven't written them down or else once again, just writing them down, writing them down. You know, yes. we did a Messier marathon three or four years ago. Uh, and I ended up with 60 something about one o'clock when the clouds rolled in, you know, right. I was, I was banging them out. Good. I mean, I was hammering through them. Um, but, but that's a race that's not a leisurely walk, walk through the mm -hmm. forest. And, you know, most of this oftentimes is, is about the leisurely walk through the woods. I know people I've gone on hikes with and I'll stop and, and say something. So I didn't see that. In fact, we were in Boy Scouts once and we were hiking through the uh, uh, wildlife management area and we walked right past this guy who was bow hunting. And we got to the camp and we we're talking about it. And, and Eddie Thomas, a good friend of mine said, so about it, I said, yeah, he was right by the trail. And everybody was like, huh? And everybody in the patrol, there was like 12 of us, every one of them walked within six feet of this guy. And they didn't see him because they Who weren't. Was this guy? Sir? Who was it? I, it was just some guy bow hunting out in, on this wildlife management area. Okay. And he was sitting up against this tree. And I saw him and Eddie saw him, but nobody else saw him. And he was literally, literally right there. I think the joy is is of the hike is not the destination; it's the journey. It's just like astronomy. I I love hiking through the woods and and seeing a tree in bloom or seeing a bird or noticing mm -hmm. a cool rock formation or or pretty moss or you know a buckeye bush that's got buckeyes on it. Whatever, noticing those details as I get there. I think that's sort of like astronomy. You know, it's not about getting to the camp; it's about the journey. You never really finish the journey in astronomy. You're always going to a new destination. Right. That's right. But, but you know, Messier marathons are, 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 are sprints to do it fast, but that's not the way to do it. Ultimately is, you know, 
one, if you haven't done the SEAs before, you're not going to be able to get 60 or 70 in a night. You've got to know where they are to be able to get them and know That's what you're true. seeing. You got to find true. them. So, right. Anyway, but I'm going to commit really to good at uh, looking at star maps and going directly to those objects, you know. And I'll tell you what, <clears throat> a Telrad and a Telrad chart is a lifesaver. Sure. Uh, I mean, it is, if, if there's one device I would say put on your telescope, is to put a Telrad on your telescope or, or a device like that and then uh, procure the books that are designed for, for your reticle. So it makes it so much easier to do. Um, right. It, it's, it's cheating in some people's views. Uh, just like a, cheating. Huh? How is it cheating? Well, you didn't have to look at a star, a star chart and, and, and star hop to it. You were able to just cheat. I would, well, if that's, if that's cheating, then I would say using a star chart is cheating. Okay. Well, that's yeah, so exactly. You don't know the sky well enough to not have any maps or anything, right. okay? And you can find these things and recognize them. Well, uh, if, if, we, if we didn't have any light pollution, that would be possible because we could really go out and look at the stars every night and, well, and, and memorize those things. I could take you where it's very, very dark and you should be able to see all of them. I mean, the messy objects are not that faint. Nope. But, you know, the, the fact that you can use a tool, apply that tool and explore, explore the sky with it, I think is, is totally valid yeah. and... Um, you know, I, I wouldn't consider using a Telrad and a Telrad chart to find these objects cheating either. No, you know, it's not. It's you not. Know, some um, people say it is. I don't think it is. It's using what, a, what might be cheating is using a computerized telescope and just punching it in and then saying, OK, there it is, because, you know, that it's going to nail every object in the sky. Um, and, that, and that's the techno. There's no there's no effort involved other than typing the keyboard. Right. You know, the telescope does all the work, at least with a Telrad. You've got to find the constellation, line it up, move it, and then zero in on, on the target through your telescope and actually get it into view and, and do it. There is work involved. And, right. and I will say, after just starting out and doing a little poking around, the Messier Objects is by far a grand gateway into the sky mm -hmm. uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. Because on any given night, you can see 80 of them. Um, they're from the southern horizon to the North Pole. Um, they're in all the const around all the constellations. There's a whole variety of things in them. And if you're contemplating trying to start, I think the Messier Objects is a great place to start yeah. because there's lots of data, lots of information, and they're pretty easy to find. Some of them are tough, but most of them are pretty easy to find. Right. Right. That's true. That's true. And they're exciting to find. The first time you find them, it's just like, wow, you know. So, hey, I had asked uh, in the audience, uh, and I don't know if, um, if uh, Cameron Gillis is able to do this, but I asked him to come on. I will uh, talk about Cameron a little bit. Last night, he was showing uh, his program Sky Safari, and, um, and maybe some other programs too, but... Uh, it was, um, you know, how he was documenting uh, his his visual observation of the of the galaxies that he was going after, and uh, he'd made a, an impressive log of like over 600 objects. Um, he showed, you know, the thousand plus objects that that he had visited with his telescope, but uh, had actually made a log of 600. Uh, I think 680. 80 objects, something like that. It was impressive what he was doing and how he was yes. tracking it. Right. You know, and I haven't, I wish I would have written down every, I said this before, I wish I would have written down everything I'd looked at, whether it was sitting in the backyard with my dad looking at a meteor shower or whether it was uh, uh, trying to take a lunar eclipse or, or with Paul and Kathy at the Nebraska star party or, you know, the winter star party or wherever. I wish I would have done that. The comets and stuff, I, I just didn't do it, you know. Yep. And I, I'm I'm saddened by the fact I didn't. Well, no time to start. start like now. That's right. <laughs> and start. Then this is now. And and start start about talk uh, starting now. We need to get Heath on next week, and show. Have you seen the picture of the moon he did? No, I haven't. Oh, you know, he's he's been quiet, and you know, I've had yeah. him on shows before, and and. Uh, 
you know, I think he enjoys it. Um, he shot last week. He shot the moon, and he did a, I think, a twenty-seven panel mosaic. What? And has it's like uh, eighty-seven megabytes. You know, not a huge because, it, but it's 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 pretty cool. And cool. Uh, and he's figured out the Registax and uh, the mosaic program, and now he's working using GIMP to try and manipulate it and figure Seriously. out how to fine tune it. So oh, that's good. And he's a, get him on. He's a beginner. I mean, absolutely. So literally, he walked in here a year and a half ago with a telescope that he bought. It was a Sears telescope, a Goodwill store for ten or five dollars. And he just walked in hoping we'd be able to help him. And we looked at it and he was really jazzed about it. And I told him how to take it apart. And and he came back in and he fixed it up. And, you know, he's got, it's, it's not, it's, it's like a 30 millimeter telescope, but, but it got him a job here. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, That's and right. so he's really started, you know, just starting to get into astrophotography. He started out, he's a, uh, I think it was a 102 on a, on an alt as mount. And he realized there was just too much blur and stuff. So he ended up putting it on a Exos 100 and guiding with it that allowed him to, to track much better and, and significantly improved his uh, uh, detail that he acquired. Uh, so um, he's really jazzed about it. And it's a full moon, but it looks really sharp. So we need to have him on like next week. Okay. All right. So uh, corral him for the first Light Chronicles show. Yep. And we'll yep. Do it. I wanted to recognize some of the people that are watching today. Uh, Mike Wiesner was the first one to log in, uh, saying hello to everybody. Book Davies uh, is with us, with a big woot. And um, uh, we have uh, Richard Grace, the Astro Beard, saying hello to everyone. Um, uh, Book says, it rained in buckets here earlier. Uh, that's, it, it rained crazy here too. So, um, uh, Andrew Corkill is watching. Uh, we've got, uh, um, he says, hello. Uh, Greg George, um, uh, he says, no way, the real app, Mike Wiesner? Yep, that's right. You just never know who you might meet here. Um, <laughs> well, we've got uh, Paola Sagarboza, and he says, hello, everyone. Uh, Jeff Wise uh, says, hello. Beatrice Hines, uh, she says, hello. I was doubting if there was a show of yesterday. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it to the party of last night. I was very tired, but I watched a part and we'll watch the rest and replay. Thank you, Beatrice. Um, Mike Wiesner, uh, let's see. Nice conversations amongst all y'all. Um, Greg George, a big fan of your Mighty ETX work. He's, that's a shout out for Mike Wiesner, the Mighty ETX guy. Um, Cameron Gillis is, of course, on. We were just talking about him. Uh, Harold Locke, we were talking about him, too. Um, and uh, Martin Eastburn is here. Um, and who else? We have a nice group today. Um, Chris Larson. He was on the, he was watching the Global Star Party. Beatrice says she received my Astro delivery today. Big smiley face. The Finder Guide Scope, um, Explore Scientific Guide Scope, 10 by 60 Hylical, uh, must be in a helical, uh, I guess maybe. Uh, it's well built and the image is very sharp. I can't wait to test it out. Uh, probably bring in clouds, Beatrice, so uh. don't, don't show the weather that you got new um, astronomy gear. Um, let's see. Uh, Beatrice is asking, uh, and Pekka is here, sorry for his late arrival, but have a little bit of turbulence on, on head side. A little fuzzy feeling with no sleep after the star party. Sorry about that, Pekka. You did go the, the full term, you know, of the star party, so that was, that was a big effort. Um, it looks like Cameron's popped in. Cameron's here. Yeah, he's yep. been watching. Um, hey, guys. Oh, did you? Oh, really? Did you pop in? Yeah, Cameron? he's here. Yeah. Great. Yes, yes. Did you pull off the side of the road, or are you at home now? No, I, I'm, I'm just driving. <laughs> You're I'm, driving? I'm gonna be 
<laughs> with the yeah, Orion just... Nebula behind you driving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You you're bet. really driving, yeah. aren't you? Yeah. Okay. You're all not pulled all over. All, all right. So be careful. Um, yeah, no, I'll be parking shortly. I just wanted to uh, let you know that I'm, I'll be uh, available in about a couple minutes here. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's fine. That's fine. So, Scott, so we we'll were talk talking about, we'll, we'll show Beatrice how to sign up um, uh, as an Explore Alliance member. She has questions about that. Um, and, we were talking uh, about the weather, Scott. I thought I would... Uh, share the uh, screen let me do this our weather station we have a weather station on top of the yeah, building now we not only have a weather station but we have a weather group called um explore weather on right. facebook so if you let me see if i can pull that up for you so this is our weather station it's 69 degrees here fahrenheit uh wind gusts to 10 currently uh, almost 11. uh no no uv because there's the sun's not out uh, it's quit raining, but what's cool is I like to get down here to this chart right here. This is the precipitation. It poured huh, right here. It rained uh, one and a half inches in about 20 minutes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was astounding how hard it was. There was massive flash flooding in the county north of us. Uh, some school buses were washed off the roads. Oh, there's a truck uh, kind of washed off the road yeah, just right just next not, door to us here. Yeah. So. You know, they had dozens and dozens of swift water rescues. Um, I think potentially a couple of people did perish in it. Uh, but amazingly, there was one car I was listening to uh, washed off the road with a father and two kids. And miraculously, and the car was completely underwater. Miraculously, they got out and were found downstream, all alive, clinging to branches. Uh, so, you know, that's amazing. It's amazing. But yeah, anyway, they, they'll have a big story to tell yep. their kids. And if, oh boy, the and trauma of it. and everybody, the, the trauma of that. But we sell these weather stations. Yeah. Um, and they're they're great devices. They're yeah, pretty, pretty popular. It's working you know. really good for us. We yep. have it mounted right above the uh, Explore Scientific store uh, front door. And uh, uh, we had a, it showed a 38 mile per hour gust of wind and stuff like that. I plan to put up um, some sort of uh, webcam or something like that. We have this new webcam from Alpen that I want to put up there. You know, it's got a waterproof housing and everything. So Scott, so that's a good camera. Power to it. I think that would be the trick. Yeah. Um, we've, we've played with that camera, uh, you know, in, in prototype. And that's a darn good camera that's coming out. Yeah. yeah, here's that 30 mile an hour gust, 36, Woo. 30, almost 37 mile an hour gust right there this right. last night. Yeah. Right. And, uh, Maybe Elon will take up one of our, our power, our weather stations and leave it up there on Mars or something. Yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. Um, I wanted to share the um, Explore Weather group on Facebook so you can see what that looks like here. We have almost a thousand members coming up on it anyways. Um, uh, Explore Weather, uh, it, one of the admins on there is meteorologist Dan Scoff. Also, there's a, uh, the storm chaser from... Uh, from the uh, Weather Channel, uh, Charles Peak. Um, both of those guys live locally around here, and they are amazing. Uh, uh, they have amazing knowledge of the weather, um, and uh, you know we have people from, I guess, around the world that submit mm -hmm. beautiful. Look at that! This is a beautiful uh, rainbow here after a storm. Um, there's our, there's our weather station doing, cranking away, doing its job. Look at this bolt of lightning. Oh my God, amazing. So some of the photography and the inspiration that people uh, uh, experience from seeing um, you know, the weather systems here on Earth is also very fascinating to us. Um, here's some sort of uh, tornado chaser guy, really dramatic shot. Um, you know, halos and all kinds of weather, you know, uh, or atmospheric phenomena is also described here. Um, so it's, it's, uh, 
it's it's great. And right now we have, um, uh, you know, our weather is really cranking up for, you know, tornadic type of activity and all the rest of it. So I expect to uh, see and learn more about severe weather this this uh, this season. So. And Cameron, that, are you on? That picture right there on top is a uh, Charles Peak photo. That's a Charles Peak it was, photo. It was two right. supercells merging. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. It just looks ominous, you know. It was yeah. ominous. <laughs> it was. It's ominous. That's right. So yeah. I'm ready, Scott. So um, you're all set. Yeah, yeah. Set. All right. Well, I'll stop sharing. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, can't. Don't let me forget to. Uh, walk people through joining the Explorer yes, Alliance. Okay? We'll do. Yep, ten four. All right. So you. So we were talking about the importance <coughs> of documenting documenting your um, observations, and you kind of went through that whole process uh, using a. The, I think it was plat this platform of Sky Safari. Is that right? That's right. I mean, uh, you know, you're right. I mean, b before that, it was pencil and paper. Um, and and uh, and I use an Excel spreadsheet uh, in the future. Sometime in the future, I'll I'll share that because uh, that was a, a major analysis I, I've done um, where I had everything logged in in Excel. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, but now uh, with Sky Sky Safari, it makes it a heck of a lot easier to uh, be able to go through and and check your uh, your objects and then and then start logging observations. So like for example here. Uh, you know, if I if I just look at the um, the observation that I had, a distinct oval patch with brighter core, for example. And what's what's nice is, as you start uh, creating more and more observations, uh, the autofill on the um, on the smartphone or on the tablet uh, start to so you can just type things. So this makes it you can keep your eye on the eyepiece and then. You literally uh, you you tap a couple of uh, letters and then and then you can actually oh, log. Right. It makes a lot uh, easier. Log, makes it a heck of a lot easier because a lot of it's like repeated um, themes, whether you know it's uh, whether it's modeling or you know diffuse or or concentrated or you know these types of words, which mm -hmm. would take a while to type or even write. Uh, but now you can actually be very nicely focus on what you're seeing. And and then the logging uh, kind of nicely captures that as well. So, are you able to print this out or export the file somehow to like? Um... That's the beautiful part. If I go if I go to uh, my observation list. So if I look at my observation list here, uh, these are the number of objects in each con con category. So uh, Libra has twenty seven, etc. And each of these here is this is locally on this phone. It actually, if you if you buy um, a subscription, it's like twenty bucks a year for Live Sky. Click on Live Sky. Okay. Uh, Live Sky okay. actually synchronizes, so I can go from my phone to my tablet to my computer to my PC, and it actually uh, has all those observations. So you, if you go, um, if I look at my observations here, um, where is it here? Uh, here we are, observations. If I click on observations from my observations and I go uh, observing lists, you'll see that uh, they're all listed here. And there was, a, for example, the best and brightest is 688. And what you can do is you can actually uh, download it. Mm -hmm. And when you download it, it will actually put it in CSV. Uh, so I can put my spreadsheet that I built in the okay. past, I can, I've actually made a, a lookup table so that basically I can I could just pull in all my observations and then match it up with the uh, information. And then I, 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 you remember there was an NG, NGC IC project um, uh, website in the past. Um, the, the, I downloaded all to, the- uh, To make uh, the positions more accurate or something? I, exactly, exactly. So it had all the lats longs and everything, uh, sorry, the, the right of section declination uh, yeah. values. And I actually just do a, a V lookup. I merge the, the descriptions okay. and then I can match my observations with that. And I actually have a plot. I've actually, you know, while we're here, uh, might as well, might, might as well do that. Let me show you. Uh, this is if I go OneDrive and I go, uh, go back. And I go, where is it? You're doing this all on your phone, right? 
this is all on my phone yeah yeah wow so what i I, ha I have one drive which which means that everything i can access uh and that's how i was able to get the the link uh for for today um if i go to references where was it probably references no no here we are um the one thing that uh, we need to have your company work on is a transporter tool so that your phone can transport you from location to location so not just call it yeah. Here's an observation list. Uh, so, so I have all my uh, my. Uh, here's all the. It, do, it doesn't show up very well. It's kind of squeezed. But I have all the categories, and I have all the information, including what it looked like. Uh, it's kind of not zoomed in here very good. But uh, the interesting thing is, I made an observing chart. Uh, mm -hmm. I, as, yeah, here we are. This is. You can see all the the information. If I go to observing chart. Uh, do. No, no, no. Sorry about that. Back there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I go to the tab. Oh. The tape. There we go. There you are. So what I did is I actually did an XY uh, plot. And um, can you see this? Yeah. Yeah. So I did an X Y plot, and I, I, I made a legend uh, for galaxy, um, you know, nebula, planetary, in the same format that uh, Sky Atlas two thousand. I, I like that color scheme, right? Um, so for open clusters and that, and I actually have this on a kind of a conformal map uh, showing, and you can you can clearly see the Milky Way, right? All the clusters uh, in that band, and then you can see the galaxies in Virgo, and uh, so that was my earlier, this was my earlier version when I had my Dobsonian, very manual. But now uh -huh. with, uh, with, now I have the, uh, the Sky Safari, I've been having a blast. If I go back to my it's Sky all Safari, it's all. it's all connected. So it makes it a lot more maintainable. Uh, you know, it's much easier and synchronized. And I, I encourage anyone, you know, uh, who's watching this, uh, it's a great way to really, um, be organized and and mm -hmm. and uh, and 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 log all your your stuff and and it's really 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 cool. So um, very cool. yeah, very cool. Yeah, so so I I was uh, that's basically what I've been doing. So, and then oh yeah, the, the, the only can, thing else you can uh, yeah. do these observing programs and and you know interact with the star map and all of that. So it's so dynamic. Yeah, and what I've done is I, I I'm gonna I I just bought an imager uh it's from OPT. Uh, the 294. I'm going to okay. get into astro imaging, and um, and basically, uh, if I get rid of the timing here, uh, you can see that uh, I actually have uh, some some of the frames. Um, this 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 large uh, this large square is the field of view that would be on the ED80 when when that comes, uh, mm -hmm. and then and, and then uh, the smaller aperture is the other two squares is. Uh, the uh, eight-inch Schmidt Castle Green with an F six um, five uh, focal reducer, and then and then of course the smallest one is the native uh, focal length of two thousand, um, with with the same uh, sensor. So what I can do is you know my my ultimate goal is I'm going to actually eventually have multiple sensors uh, and 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 piggyback the ED eighty on top of the on top of the uh, Schmidt Castle Green, and that way I can take uh, you know, same uh, multiple exposures at two different focal lengths simultaneously, and and do do kind of a, a sky survey. And what I did is I bought. Um, let me just uh, go. Sorry here. Uh, go ahead. I ended up uh, splurging, and I got because it's on sale right now. I, I upgraded. The, the, what I've been using is Sky Safari Plus. But the skies for because uh, that's all I needed for visual. But once you start start to get into imaging, if I if I go uh, to the same area in Mark Carrion's train chain, yeah, let's go to if I go to the same area. You're going to need to have uh, a, a better database to be able to really find those fainter galaxies. Like I remember what sure. uh, Jason Gonzalez did, right? He right. had that. So if I start zooming in here to the same area, you can see and and I. I you yeah. can actually start to see now you're seeing the galaxy. That. You know, this galaxy is uh, if it behind is 16.4 magnitude 16.4, for example, behind uh, M87 or M86. 
and then uh, and then if you go further up here you have the coma pernicious uh, cluster um yeah yeah up here actually you know what i need to do well, give me a second uh i'm gonna just to make it easier to uh, observe i'm gonna go stars let's just show what you can do here let's go down the 13 magnitude deep sky limited magnitude let's go down to 16.6 now you can start to see and uh yeah that's good let me go back now yeah so now you can start to see the density uh you know as you start imaging uh you can start to uh here we go here's a coma vernicius cluster oh and that's not it no anyhow um yeah here you go there we go so you can see the density of uh, galaxies in here so i can take an imaging field and and really deep dig deep 17th magnitude galaxies and i'm I, I would love to be you know with an ed80 i don't know what's possible but uh you know with imaging and and stacking um probably can 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 get uh, you know grasp uh, into you know 17th 18th magnitude which is beyond visual of even an 18 inch uh, scope right mm -hmm. so so uh so I, that's kind of you know the next stage uh, <laughs> i'm kind of right. you know i i have many many years of uh, of of enjoyment here <laughs> I, yeah that's right you got a whole universe to uh, go after here. yeah that's great yeah anyhow so i, I just Cameron, wanted to... thanks for jumping in with us here um uh, you bet uh, you know hopefully you made it uh, um you know back on your uh <laughs> travel safely without uh, raising too many eyebrows um uh no, thanks yeah and so um you know it makes me think that uh, we could have like a whole um you know step by step how do you do this um you know all the you know getting this on your phone linking it all up making your first observation maybe we can have like a little class or something like that on there if you're so inclined cameron i would love to and i, I would i'd even like to have an ongoing you know update uh, uh, as i'm doing my sure. survey uh, you know, it, it's going to be an ongoing forever project, but it would be kind of neat to kind of give an, an update on, on, on the progress. And, sure. uh, you know, I'd, I'd love to do that. And then, and then show the techniques, because this is stuff that, you know, what we were talking about even in the earlier days, uh, well, earlier days for me, but at the beginning of the year, Scott, where we're talking about cloud-based and uh, crowdsourcing, right? When you, you right. as right. we start, as we start enabling the whole engine of our team here, all the women all the men all the kids all the yeah. you know everyone yeah. and you start to show them really easy ways in which they can contribute and log wow i mean it's going to be a blast right, right. we're going to have a great collaboration here all right well let's uh, <laughs> we'll talk about it offline and see what yeah. the best way is to to uh, go after that but i'm all in so okay awesome thank you all, all right, right cameron that's great thanks, thanks. again Cheers. thanks Bye -bye. again um we did want to show we did want to show where you go to join and talk about the Explore Alliance memberships. Let me, I've got the page pulled up here. Um, and here we go. So uh, if you just go to this, um, this link, explorescientificusa.com, um, this membership page that we have here, and I'll, I'll put it in the, um, in the chat so you can see it easy to get to okay and there are two different kinds of memberships there is um, you know if you're international um, uh, you know the legacy memberships are probably the best one to have it's a it, it costs zero dollars um, it gets you uh, uh, access you know sneak peeks of our new products VIP access uh, to some of the events Beatrice if you're up for it um, at, at some time, I've just uh, um, uh, talked to um, the uh, state park people at Karchner Caverns. I did that today. And they are penciling us in for September of next year uh, for the next Arizona Dark Sky Star Party. 
we had a blast there. Um, and, uh, you know, Kent was there and uh, we had, uh, you know, David Levy was there. A number of, a number of uh, iconic astronomers were there to give lectures, including like Fred Espinak, who's Mr. Eclipse. Um, Jack Newton was there, you know, great astrophotographer. We had door prizes. We had uh, uh, three or four nights. Was it three nights? Four, or four nights. Nights? four nights. Of four nights of perfect, perfect dark skies. Okay. Perfect nights. Yeah. And uh, so it was a lot of fun. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, th there's VIP access to that, to, to those events that we have. Went to um, Palomar. Not Palomar, but uh, um, what observatory did we go to? I'm drawing a blank. Up on, you're talking about um, uh, on top of. Um, oh my God. You gosh. made me draw a blank. I'm trying. <laughs> oh. Was, oh, goodness gracious. That's. I can't believe you and I both can't come up with it. I was going to say it, and then you for, said I'd forgotten it. It made me forget. This is Kit Peak. National Peak. Observatory. Gee, Merry yeah. Christmas. So you guys took a tour of Kitt Peak. Uh, this time what we're supposed to do is to go and making lab at University of Arizona. I'm going to ask, since Chris Empey has been on our shows, Chris is a professor there, and I'm going to ask him if he would uh, come and give a talk at the event, or at the very least, uh, for us to go and uh, meet him at Kitt Peak or something like that. So it'd be very cool. Uh, or at the mirror making lab, you know, because we'll be right there at uh, University of Arizona as well. So, uh, but uh, the idea about these kinds of events that we do is we want to try to give you an experience that would be, uh, you know, something that you would remember for the rest of your life. And um, um, aside from that event, we're also planning an event at... Um, uh, Mount Wilson Observatory, where we'll take you into the historic 60-inch telescope and let you actually look through a giant telescope, uh, uh, which is amazing. And um, on top of that, uh, we would take you to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory for an inside tour. And, um, you know, so you can see the, perhaps the Mars Yard and some of that is very, very to, interesting. To get in, you have to be a U.S. citizen, correct? At JPL. It's my understanding, yeah, you need to be a U.S. citizen. It's something they check. Uh, I will double check that, but um, um, but um, you know, and there's so many other things to do uh, in the L.A. Pasadena area that have to do with science. You know, uh, there's the Huntington Library, which is uh, an incredible um, place in itself. There's Griffith Park Observatory, which is right there. Um, you know, and of course, uh, Mount Wilson. Uh, we would then probably take like a, um, uh, you know, an easy day. And then the last day, which would be Sunday, we're going to try to use the historic snow telescope, which is a solar telescope that George Ellery Hale used uh, quite a bit up there at Mount Wilson to help unlock the secrets of the sun. So, um, so you know, uh, we are step by step as we more and more of us get vaccinated and more and more of us are able to um, travel uh, you're, you're going to start to see in-person events come back but that does not mean that we won't uh, continue to do uh, our our virtual um, you know live casting that we're doing uh, it's a great way to stay in touch with you and it's the only way to have a global star party you can't do it any other way so until then, I, do you have anything more that you'd like to add? Um, no, I think it's awesome. It's love these shows. Yeah, you know, and I can't wait to go to. Hopefully, you'll you'll have me carry your suitcase to those star parties. Oh, uh, you'll you'll be doing more than that. So, uh, um, <laughs> so um, let us know if you have any interest in those programs. You can send an email to Explore Alliance at explorescientific.com. We'll give you early information. Um, we'll get you, uh, you know, we'll at least make you a free member of Explore Alliance. And if you want to be a platinum member, it costs you a hundred bucks, but we give you a hundred dollar gift card right back. So uh, it really doesn't cost anything. If you plan to buy an eyepiece or something like that from us, 
uh, you definitely want to get the platinum membership because there's a lot. Yeah, of I recommend. It. I recommend the sixty-two degree. <laughs> <a good> <laughs> They're <deal>. perfect. <laughs> yeah, it's a great deal. It's a good deal. Okay, well, Cameron, thanks again for coming on and for uh, showing us everything that you did last night. You were on all during the broadcast, which I think went five hours or something, maybe longer. Yes. Um, Yes. And, uh, and so you were, you were on towards the very end, uh, but uh, uh, as always, you're a fantastic contributor, and, um, so, okay. and I really admire your enthusiasm for, all, for what you're doing and, and how you uh, encourage others to just get started and, and, uh, you know, and start making their own explorations of the sky and their own astrophotographs, and um, so... Yeah, I, no, I really have lots of really submissions fun. to the uh, smartphone astrophotography contest, which is going on right now, folks. So uh, get those smartphones out and start making some images. Until then, yes. uh, we'll see you tomorrow and take care and keep looking up. Here's the Explore Scientific IXOS 100 equatorial tracker mount. Uh, we've got it mounted up here with a digital SLR that's got the uh, uh, dovetail plate here. We also have it kind of mounted on our extra, extra heavy duty tripod. Uh, but uh, this, this whole thing is operated remotely. You can see Ken's operating it with uh, his uh, Apple tablet here. Uh, but it'll run off a Windows tablet or an Android tablet. What do you like about this whole system, Ken? I find it very intuitive. It's very quiet. Um, like any go-to system, there are things to learn. Sure. But once you learn those things, it makes it really easy to find stuff in the sky. Sure. Now, this is running our Explore Stars app. If you're going to do astrophotography, you need to be running it with the Planetarium program. Or ASCOM. That's right. ASCOM so this ASCOM runs program. wireless, wired. Okay. It's super versatile. It not only has go-to uh, capabilities, but uh, it, you can also add a, um, a guide scope with an auto guider CCD type of camera onto it. So, uh, and you know, the thing that you're gonna really love about this is the price of this instrument, um, which will fit neatly into your uh, budget, I'm sure. So uh, check it out, look online, check out the specs, give us a call if you have any questions.